In popular imagination, the word Neanderthal conjures one scene. Heavy brows, broad shoulders, a life in shadows and stone. But were they truly a single, pure strain? Or is that picture too simple? Ancient DNA has begun to answer, and the answers keep complicating what we thought we knew. The turning point came when researchers realized the past leaves more than artifacts. It leaves code. With the first high-quality Neanderthal genomes, a new archive opened. We were no longer limited to tools and teeth marks. We could read inheritance, letter by letter, preserved by caves near 50 degrees Fahrenheit. If a handful of genomes could reframe a chapter, what would dozens do? Across Europe and Western Asia, teams mapped a range more than 3,000 miles long. Famous caves and new ones alike yielded fragments, bones and teeth treated as both fossil and archive. And it wasn't the dramatic skull that gave up the most. Often it was something smaller. If you want to hear the past, start with what remembers best. Teeth do. The dense layers inside a molar can shield DNA for tens of millennia. Soak in the petrous portion of the temporal bone, an inner ear fortress the size of a coin. In the lab, a tooth root is trimmed, a channel drilled, and pale powder just grams, is treated with carefully controlled chemicals. From that dust, ancient DNA is coaxed free and prepared for sequencers. One stray modern cell can drown out a whisper, so everything is filtered, gloved, and cold. Once sequenced, those ancient letters are not read alone. They're compared against other Neanderthal genomes, against Denisovian DNA from Siberia, and against the genomes of tens of thousands of living people. That's how structure appears, how movement leaves a trace, how meetings stop being rumors and become evidence. The old picture says Neanderthals all look the same. The data says otherwise. Genes linked to pigmentation, hair structure, and immune response vary across Neanderthals. Some carried variants associated with lighter skin under low UV skies. Others did not. Faces were generally robust, but details, jaw breadth, tooth size, nasal shape, shifted by region and time. Think less single face and more family resemblance stretched over a continent. Genetically, Western and Eastern groups form related but not identical branches. Even within one region, lineages rose, mingled, and sometimes vanished leaving faint traces of one group inside another. Their routes were not sea lanes and caravans. They followed river valleys that guided herds, forest edges that funneled seasonal moves, passes that opened for weeks and closed for months. Different bands favored different territories and thrived in them. Across distances measured in hundreds of miles, they met, exchanged mates, and shared knowledge. And they did not evolve alone. People living outside Africa today carry, on average, a small but real percentage of Neanderthal ancestry. Our ancestors met theirs and had children, multiple times in different places. Timelines point to several pulses of mixing, roughly between 60,000 and 45,000 years ago. But the arrow did not point only one way. Some Neanderthal genomes also carry signals of modern human DNA from even earlier encounters. In one Siberian cave, a girl had a Neanderthal mother and a Denisovian father, first generation, unmistakable. Each discovery widens the frame and turns pure into a myth. If that challenges the idea of a single Neanderthal identity, it should. What once looked like fixed buckets, this culture here, that tool there, now looks like overlapping circles. Mosterian toolkits show local flavors. Pigments and ornaments appear in some contexts long doubted. At one site, stone traveled dozens of miles. At another, shelters were rebuilt year after year. The pattern of a band that knew its land like a backyard. Isotope analyses, tiny chemical fingerprints and teeth, map where individuals grew up and later moved. Some stayed close to home. 
Others crossed ridges and rivers, joining new bands or bringing mates back. Identity, it turns out, is what people do together. For Neanderthals, as for us, it was a way of living, not a single bloodline. So what does the typical Neanderthal look like now? Less like a caricature, more like a population with real variation and reach. Strong, yes, because skeletons say so. Often cold adapted, because nasal passages and limb proportions suggest it. But also flexible, curious, and connected enough to borrow and blend. In the West, some individuals cluster as close kin, cousins within a few generations, hinting at small, tight-knit groups. In the East, ties stretched along step corridors. Across their range, immune genes speak of long battles with local pathogens, while metabolic genes hint at diets heavy in large mammals in some regions and more varied in others. The more we read, the less one thing Neanderthals become. That diversity matters when we ask why they're gone. It's tempting to describe their disappearance as a single moment. Ancient DNA warns against that. Replacement by our ancestors was staggered, local, and incomplete. In some places, Neanderthal groups persisted alongside modern humans for thousands of years. Wherever the two met, some Neanderthal DNA entered our lineage and stayed. So, extinction is not quite the right word. A better one might be absorption. In the way geneticists measure it, Neanderthals are both gone and not gone. Visible in small segments scattered through millions of people today. Genetics don't tell the whole story. Bones still speak. Cut marks, healed fractures, traces of fire in plant resins, microscopic wear on stone edges. These details anchor the story that DNA expands. They tell us about daily life. Hafting adhesive mixed with care. Hunting strategies tuned to terrain. Shelters revisited year after year. They also hint at hard seasons when resources ran short. A few sites preserve evidence that the living process the remains of their dead, language chosen carefully because it is both accurate and respectful. Sometimes genetics links those remains into families, and choices and crises become personal. Mobility and exchange stitched these groups together. Raw materials traveled, flint from a ridge 60 miles away, pigments from a basin a hundred miles off, proving that bands tracked landscapes beyond a day's walk. Children learned edges by watching elders. Knowledge moved with people, and so did genes. All of this cuts through old myths. There was no single Neanderthal essence spanning the Atlantic to the Altai. There were many Neanderthals, regional, changing, interconnected. Some carried alleles that today influence sleep in northern latitudes. Others pass down immune variants that shape how bodies respond to infections. A few lineages met us and left their mark inside us. A few met other archaic groups and braided the tree tighter than expected. Identity was never a fixed recipe based on ancestry alone. It was lived experience, membership, place, practice, and it could change. Change the story, and you change how we see ourselves. Every new sequence adds another thread, and the weave gets clearer. The picture that emerges is not a row of identical faces in identical caves. It's a map of bands and families moving across landscapes, of exchanges that carried both ideas and DNA, of survival that depended on flexibility as much as strength. The truth ancient DNA reveals is not that Neanderthals were just like us, or utterly unlike us. It is that they were people, distinct, adaptive, connected, and that some part of them endures within us today. Teeth and petrous bones gave us the alphabet, sequencers gave us sentences, and now we're learning to read the whole paragraph, line by line, life by life until the old picture gives way to the real one, richer, more human, and far more compelling than anyone guessed.